You know that um, as believers and people that have been called to walk alongside with God on this earth, we are some of the most prone people to having a roller coaster of emotions. The highs and the lows. And one of the reasons why we are the most prone is because the spirit wars against the flesh. And the flesh wars against the spirit. There is a war going on. And that which is of the heart has to contend with that which is of the flesh. When I was coming and getting ready to come here tonight, I sensed joy welling up in my spirit. Just so much joy. And then by the time I got into my car and I was heading this way, maybe a couple of minutes into the drive, a spirit of heaviness was coming over me to replace the joy that I was feeling. And I'm like, okay, this almost has no meaning. I thought initially, what is the meaning of this? Why am I suddenly feeling heavy when I had been so light-bodied and rejoicing in the Lord? And so this is what I had to remind myself. I had to remind myself that in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. I may actually prefer the way I was sounding, if, if that's a possibility. Um, in the presence of God, the Bible says there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. So if whatever it is that I am feeling or that I may, or that may have come to fill up my consciousness, if that thing is not mentioned to be present in God's presence, then I know what to do. Heaviness is not in God's presence. The presence of the Lord is full of joy. So what I realized immediately was that, okay, the flesh noticed that the spirit was winning a couple of minutes ago because it was rejoicing in the Lord. And the flesh is like, I need to do something. I need to open up the window and the doors and the portals to darkness because this light is becoming too much for the flesh. You know, the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity against God. And so that was what the flesh was trying to do. And I had to push back by the word of God. You know, many of us were raised to be told that, oh, when you feel things like that, that is Satan coming to attack you. And then we're busy fighting Satan, whereas the Bible says that a man's enemies are those of his household. You leave your own flesh behind to chase shadows. Just imagine if I was there binding and losing. I will be functioning in ignorance and we've done that. But the reality of it is that as a man of God, as one that has been called to be alongside with the Lord, we need to be knowledgeable in the things of the spirit. The Bible says, God speaking, that my people perish for lack of knowledge and that we are told not to be ignorant of the devices of the crafty. So I want to encourage you, like I've been telling you and like I said again about two meetings ago, that you do not fight the battles of the mind with your mouth shut. Even though what you're wrestling against are thoughts, you don't always go thoughts for thoughts because there are times wherein you need to bring out the sword of the spirit. Thank God that you have a sound mind. But do not just rely on the sound mind. You need to also learn how to bring out the word of God and to speak forth the word of God. And so I just started to sing in the car, the Lord has overcome. And because he has overcome, I have overcome because I am in him. So I want to encourage you in the season that we're in, a great door of opportunity has opened. 
And when that happens, you can expect all the adversaries to come to bear. And those enemies and the oppositions are not just principalities and powers and demons. They are also your flesh. Because the flesh, that carnal consciousness that is always responsive to self-protection, that is always seeking self, that is always seeking self-preservation, also needs to be humbled and it needs to be brought to subjection. Otherwise, it will rob you of glorious moments. I could have been robbed of that glorious moment, but I refused. I said, no, I am in God's presence and there, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. So this heaviness has to be of the flesh. And what did I do? I chose to put my body under. So today we are going to go right ahead, praise the Lord, and we're going to break bread. We're just going to go ahead and break bread. I know someone's excited because they're like, wow, that means we'll probably be out of here soon. Well, if you can be that optimistic, I'm excited for you. Yes, but um, at the end of the day, you know, it's better for you to expect, Big Mace, thank you. It is better for you to expect that service will end at 1010 and then have service end at 950 so that that way you're like, man, yeah, we finished early because you've, you've learned to manage your expectations. You know, the Bible says only righteous expectations are guaranteed by God. The expectation of the righteous shall not be cut off. And so if you don't have a righteous expectation, like coming to communion house on a Tuesday and expecting to be done by 8.50, you're most likely going to be disappointed because I don't think that's a righteous expectation. A righteous expectation is for you to expect that, well, since worship has extended for as long as it did, which was amazing, by the way. Anybody, anybody enjoyed that? Come on, praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. So start to condition your mind that may, maybe the Lord was with us. The Lord is with us. Maybe you would have to get 30 minutes less sleep. You see, but it is what it is. All righty. So very quickly, we're going to go into the book of Luke chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 15. We're going to get started on that note and, and also break bread and then see more of what the Lord has for us. God is good. All righty. So Luke chapter 7. I can't but notice that I have yet to see you here before. So maybe I'll get to meet you afterwards. God bless you. Thanks for coming out. All righty, God is good. Let me see. I, I feel like calling out one more person. Uh, let me see. Who can I call out? Yeah, Justin. Justin, good to see you. I think you missed one or two services. Good to be back. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. Now I've gotten that out of my system. We can carry on. You know, when you're the last born, you have those things in you. Always wanting to call somebody out. Always wanting to tell on somebody. And I grew up always telling on my siblings, you know, especially my eldest sibling because he was the most um, experimental of all of my siblings. He always wants to try new things and all kinds of things that would get him into trouble. And he was also a drag racer. So he would sneak out and go and race and try to not let everybody, anybody know. But once he comes and I can smell the brakes and the tires, uh, I, I would say to him, man, you're in for it. I would tell. And quite often, he would bribe me with one or two things, and I would keep my mouth shut, you know, because the Bible says that um, a gift appeases the heart. So he would, he would appease me with a bribe every now and again, a cookie here and a candy there, until one day he had enough of my shenanigans. So he had done something, not even overly major, but I still wanted to call him out. So I said to him, I said, I will tell. And he looked at me and he was like, please, tell in, in just that moment, I lost all my powers. <laughs> all the powers that I had against him, apparently what had been fueling me was his ignorance or, I mean, because he wasn't aware of the power that he had. So that was what fueled me. Every time I said I would tell and he pleaded with me, he, he, that would massage my ego and I wanted to do more of it. But the moment he said, tell, he was asking me to do the worst that I was capable of. And then I suddenly realized, suddenly realized that it's not that much fun if the other person is not afraid. <laughs> okay, let's preach it then. Just imagine Satan and his cohorts, the moment they realize that you're no longer afraid. Yeah, absolutely. You can tweet that and also reference Manuelita because she was like, oh, that will preach. You know, but the whole game changes the moment you lose that fear. You know, because what, what can, the Bible says, I am not afraid. What can man do unto me? 
that the fear of man brings a snare. That's what the Bible says when you're living constantly in fear, then you cannot post what you want because you're afraid of what people will say. Oh. And the reason why people are afraid is because you have not been saying what the Lord is showing you. Romans, I mean Luke chapter 7 verse 15. The Bible says, So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. So he that was dead began to speak. And then he, the Lord Jesus, presented him to his mother. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because the entrance of your word gives light. And it brings understanding unto the simple. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, as you continue to equip us on this side, so that we may be able to draw more from that side, May we not be weary in well-doing. May we not give up on you and on ourselves. May we not give up on this training exercise that you have us in that is called the human experience. May we continue to persevere that, Lord, rather than build resent resentment against your dealings with us, we will build muscle from your dealings with us. May we not despise, O oh God, your chastening, because the chastening of the Lord is what brings sons and daughters out of us that will make him proud. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, if we are about to say, Lord, I have had enough, may we learn to hold our peace in that moment and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to break bread today from this verse of Scripture. Uh, but I feel like, God bless you, I feel like we need to add another one to it. So let me, let me take you to one from the book of Jeremiah. And if I had asked you to guess, I'm sure you could have guessed that we are still in Jeremiah. Has it been up to a year now that we've been going to Jeremiah repeatedly? Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 7. Awesome, awesome, praise the Lord. God is good. So the Lord would have me say to somebody in here today to listen very closely because the conversation that you began in your heart or that was begun in your heart with the Lord before you left the house will continue in here. I see somebody who started to engage. It was the Lord who came to you in your thoughts and then you started to have conversations and you had questions and, and you were receiving instructions but they weren't clear to you just yet. But it was time to come and so you started getting ready. And the Lord says the conversation continues here today because you need to be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. There are opportunities that you're about to be presented with and by the spirit of discernment, you will seize every moment, every opportunity. Amen. But if you are not discerning, some of those moments can pass you by. You know, the Lord's been telling us lately to, to recognize the times that we are in. We are in the times of Noah once again. And in the times of Noah, all kinds of strange beings walked the earth, including the rogue spirits that the Bible says left their original estate to come to the earth to take wives of the daughters of men. They were not the only beings that were here from outside of this place. There were also angels who were present separating the wheat from the tears. There were also angelic beings that were present that were on the Lord's side, helping to ensure that none of those animals missed their way as they were approaching the ark. There was a lot of heavenly presence upon the earth, and, and it is happening yet again. And one of the things that you need to do as one who has been set aside called and chosen, you have to be vigilant. You have to be sober. You have to be vigilant so that you do not mistreat or miss, you, you, so that you do not mistreat the heavenly beings and so that you do not misrepresent yourself to them. It's a two-way street. Namun, I will explain that very quickly. You see, when, when, when Sodom and Gomorrah were to be destroyed, there were beings 
that had come into Sodom and Gomorrah to turn the hearts of the men and the women there against the Lord. And one of those beings is called the reprobate mind. That reprobate mind is a spirit, is a being that comes to the earth on occasion. And when it comes, it's because certain conditions are fulfilled. And the condition that needs to be fulfilled for the reprobate mind to come and take people over is called negligence. When people forget the knowledge of God or neglect to teach the truth of the word of God, they open the portal for the reprobate mind to come. And when the reprobate mind comes, one of the things that you begin to see is an increase in homosexuality. So just as you and I cannot take credit for the righteousness that we have become in Christ Jesus, because it is by grace, that is also the way those who are under the spirit of reprobacy cannot completely be judged and condemned for the lifestyle that they're in. Because if we have any rights to judge them, then that means our salvation is no longer a free gift. That means it's no longer by grace. It is by our own works. But if it is by grace, we have no pedestal upon which to stand to judge another. We need to recognize that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so when a large group of people are beginning to operate in the same manner, then you need to immediately know that it is yet not them, but a force that is acting upon them. Because we need to come down sometimes from our high horses. The Bible says we know in parts and we prophesy in parts. I've been telling my wife lately that one of the things that I want to learn how to do more is to demonstrate humble confidence. To be confident in the revelation that I have, yet not arrogant. The Bible says love edifies, but knowledge puffs up. We know in parts and we prophesy in parts. Some of the things that some other people know, when you hear it, it's so strange to you that you immediately want to resist them. You cannot be of God. What are you saying? But the reality of it is that the Bible says, be, sl be slow, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, slow to wrath. What does that mean? Don't always jump to conclusions. Be quick to hear. Make sure that you're very attentive. You're picking up all the signals. But be slow to pass a judgment. Because the moment you give in to that urge to immediately pass a judgment, anger will follow, follow after. And the moment you become angry, when you are not supposed to, you also draw the anger of God. Be slow to anger, be slow to wrath. Because that anger typically evokes the wrath of God. That's why the Bible says, be angry but do not sin. And so I want to encourage you to recognize that in the times that we're in, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And in the days of Noah, people were operating under spirits of different kinds, including the reprobate mind. We saw the reprobate mind again in the time of what? Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, for the people that may not have heard me teach on this subject, I want to quickly help you out here by showing you in the book of Romans chapter 1, what exactly I'm talking about, so you do not think that maybe they have finally gotten to me and now I am being lenient on immorality. You know, God forbid that we accommodate and celebrate that which the Lord hates. But the reality of it is that we need to act as knowledgeable people, not picking battles that are not our own. We need to fight with wisdom. The Bible says, by wisdom, wage your war. And so look at Revelations, I mean the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 20. The Bible says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly being seen, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that you are, so that they are without excuse. Because although, verse 21, they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Which is what's happening today. Darkness is upon the earth, and gross darkness the people. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Sounds familiar? This generation, we think we know it all, but do we? Verse 23, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image 
like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies amongst themselves who engaged, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped the served creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So you, those are the things that you begin to see. People begin to worship creation rather than the creator. We should have expected that this was the direction that we were heading when people started to pray to the universe rather than pray to the author of the universe. People would say, oh, the universe didn't let that happen. People started to watch the things that they did, not because it is in obedience to the word of God, but because they want to avoid conflict with karma. You understand what I mean? The moment we started to see people bowing down to creation, to fallen angels and principalities and powers, that was the moment we should have known that, okay, this is where this thing is going because the reprobate mind also has an entourage. There are forces that go ahead of the reprobate mind. And when the reprobate mind came along in verse 26, the Bible says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. We can begin to think about all of the ways by which women in our generation have exchanged that which is of natural use for that which is against nature. Let's save the rest for marriage conference. The Bible says in verse 7, likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing that which is shameful. The penalty of their error, I mean receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. The old King James says the reprobate spirit to a debased mind, to do the things, those things which are not fitting. So how did they end up becoming this shameful in their acts? Because they were giving up to a spirit that was ushered in by uncleanliness and unthankfulness because that was where it began and being overly confident in self. All of these things have become the attributes of the times that we live in, just as it was in the time of Noah. I say all of that to establish the timeline. Because unless we know where we, where we are at, sometimes we do not know how to comport ourselves. One of the things that I shared with you on Saturday was that it is imperative for you to have a place for God in your thoughts. We need to have God in our thoughts. Otherwise, we will exalt idols in our hearts and we will live our lives based on the thoughts of other people. It is a known fact that if you do not think for yourself, someone else will think for you. And when the person who thinks for you is able to control your actions, then they become a God to you. Like the Apostle Paul says, he says, the one that you obey, him you serve. Romans chapter 6. So we need to be careful which thoughts we are obeying. Who are we taking instructions from? All right? For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And so if you're not led by the Holy Spirit, you are led by some spirit because man was not made to be unled. We are meant to be led. All righty. So having established the timeline, let us quickly go back to that Jeremiah eleven seven, and then we're going to break bread. Jeremiah eleven seven, eleven seventeen, and twenty one. So eleven seven. If I let's read twenty one first of all, it says, "Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth who seek your life, saying, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hands.' Seventeen. It says, "For the Lord of hosts who planted you." has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. 
So because they offered incense to Baal, their hearts were turned against God, and then they moved on to the next level of deterioration to speak against the remnants who want to continue in faithfulness to the Lord, and they want to stop them from speaking the mind of God. You're going to see where we're going with this in a moment. It's a slow death that has come to the body, but it will not get to us because the Lord has chosen to open our eyes to see so that we do not stumble. Verse 7 says, For I earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day, I brought them out of the land of Egypt, until this day, rising early and exhorting, saying, Obey my voice. As we break bread today, one of the things that I want you to open your, I want you to open your heart to receive is the ability to see the Lord. The Bible says Jesus came to his own and his own did not know him. So what did they do? They rejected him. Revelation, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that we see says from the beginning of time, these things have been happening and revealed so that you are without excuse. There is a pattern to the way things happen. So when the Lord came with his rescue mission in the time of Noah, the people did not recognize him. When the Lord came in, in human form, when the word of God became flesh, the people did not recognize him. And so when he comes again, there will still be people who will not recognize him. And we're getting closer and closer to the time of his return. And that is the reason why it is imperative for us to have our senses sharpened so that we can discern the things of his coming. I'm still going to relate this after we break bread to the, to, to the spate of angelic visitation upon the earth so that we represent ourselves right and we do not maltreat or mistreat the ones that have been sent to bring us out. So as we break bread today, Jesus guaranteed one thing by the breaking of bread through the example that he demonstrated every time the resurrected Jesus broke bread with folks, they received consciousness of the truth. Their eyes were open to see him. Today, I want you to say to yourself, Lord, I do not want to miss you nor miss the messengers that you have sent ahead of you. Everyone that you have sent to me when they show up, I want to recognize that they are from you regardless of how strange they appear, regardless of how unusual they are, and regardless of how I may have come to conclusions prior in my mind that people who look and sound like that cannot be of God. May I not miss my visitation. So let us take the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. And there is nothing that qualifies you for the body of Jesus and the blood. So don't be thinking that you haven't been doing well so you can't take of the Lord's body. No. To think like that is to think that your salvation comes outside of the blood. Let us be confident in the blood of the Lamb because that blood alone is able to wash away all of your sins. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice that he made. We thank you for the ministry of the prophets and for the faithfulness of the apostles who have continued to allow for us to have this reminder word by the ministry of the Holy Spirit through many generations, even up until now, so that we are without excuse. You may eat and drink in Jesus' name. May we see the Lord in the beauty of his holiness and in the splendor of his love. I come to you again today by the grace of God with a reminder word. The Lord says, they have not obeyed my voice. And because they have not obeyed my voice, they have gone to Baal. And Baal has now turned their hearts against me so they have become, they've raised their hands, rather, against their brothers. Jeremiah chapter 7 says, they disobeyed. 17, 11, 7 says, they did not obey. 11, 17 says, they went to Baal. And then when we looked at 21, it says, now they are trying to stop the spirit of prophecy. I want to encourage you today to prophesy to speak the truth, regardless of who is telling you to shush. 
Because some of the people that would tell you what you're saying should not be heard. My wife and I, we met a pastor and his wife the other day. They used to pastor a church somewhere in town. And while we were talking, the wife asked me a couple of questions. And as I was answering, the husband was like, please don't tell me you preach that. The wife was like, oh, I've heard him. He preaches that. I said, yes. And it's driven several people away and I'm okay with it. Simply because people want to use whatever it is they think they have over you to stop you from fulfilling the call of God. People have done good money in my face. They're like, I'm leaving and I'm taking my money with me. And in my heart, I said to them, your money perish with you. Some people have left and said, hey, you know, I'm the one that helps you to do this. If I leave, who's going to help you? And in such moments, I've been reminded that my help does not come from the West, nor the East, nor the South, but it comes from the Northern city of the great King. It comes from above, from the father of light with whom there is no variableness. You see, people would want to use whatever influence they think they have over you to stop you from prophesying. And the Lord says, do not let them do that to you. Those are people. What about the angels? In the days of Noah, they were all over the place, but they were not recognized. In the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were, they were present, but they were not recognized. And they were mistreated. They were what? Mistreated. When they came to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, let me dial back one step. You know, because sometimes we need to know the foundation of all of what we have found ourselves in. We were brought into this place and unbeknownst to us, there was an ongoing war and every one of us that is born into this existence is caught in the crossfire. It's just the reality of things. How many people remember this movie, The War of Tomorrow or Tomorrow War? What is... You say that again? Y'all are too spiritual. Who knows the real title? The Tomorrow War. Okay, so you remember that the premise of the movie was that people were brought from another timeline and they were brought into these other future, supposedly future timeline. And you know the way they work in Hollywood is sometimes they show you the things backwards. You see, because I have learned to read the script of the enemy literally in a mirror. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because y'all remember the time that I saw an image that was published in The Economist. And you know how the economists try to tell the future in their own way because there are fortune tellers or soothsayers who work for these publications and media houses because Medea is, 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 is the false prophet, right? The enchantress. And the enchantress always has prophets or seers in her temple. So most of the successful and most successful media houses and entertainment houses, they have seers. That is the reason why cartoons can tell the future. That is the reason why some of these movies tell the future because they recruit seers, people who are gifted seers by God who can see the future, but because they are being paid by the piper, the piper calls the tunes and they use all of those great giftings to promote the agenda of Satan. But the reality of it is that they are seers and God does not take gifts that he has already given because the gifts and the callings of God, they are without repentance. And so when I, when I've, when I see some of these things that have been put out by the media houses, I can always tell by the leading of the Holy Spirit, which one is meant for me and what I'm supposed to deduce from it. So in the year 2018, they published, and they said the year in 2019, and in, and in that magazine was a picture of the four horsemen, the horsemen of the apocalypse. And that was the first time that I noticed that the horsemen of the apocalypse are not far from each other. They stand in each other's shadow. When I saw the image, I was trying to understand it. And the Holy Spirit said to me, not like this. He said, go and look at it in the mirror. And so I held it against the mirror. And that was when I realized that they actually wrote down all of the stuff that I was trying to deduce, but they wrote it backwards. And I showed that to you. I did demonstrate that to you all, the guys who were present about three years ago or four years ago, whatever time it was, that I was teaching around the subject of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so I've learned to recognize that when the world is saying this, sometimes they're showing you the inverse 
And then you have to know how to turn it the right side up. And so when they tell you that they brought them from where, whatever timeline to a future timeline, the reality of it was they took them to an ancient timeline because before we came, the Bible says there was war in the heavens. And that war is still ongoing. Because when Satan and his cohorts were driven out of heaven, the places were no more, but there was no record of the war ending. The Bible just says there was war in the heavens. And that war is still ongoing today. So when the angels of deliverance came to Sodom and Gomorrah, their presence immediately triggered the reprobate mind who was there to propagate darkness while these ones were meant to bring light. So immediately, these people, because they are spirit beings, they cannot physically operate. They would have to possess, in most cases, beings who have bodies to do their bidding. So they mobilized the people of Sodom and Gomorrah against the angels who had come to do the Lord's bidding. And they were like, we're going to molest you guys. They wanted, and that was where we had the expression to sodomize. They wanted to take advantage of this man. And... Of course, the angels would not allow themselves to be taken advantage of, so they put cause for blindness to come upon the men of Sodom and Gomorrah. But what I'm bringing out of that for us today is to recognize that we cannot be blind. Not blinded by the enemy or blinded by our own ignorance. We cannot afford to be blind. We need to be able to see because strange things, in fact, stranger things, <laughs> yeah, yeah, stranger things. Things that are happening today could not be any stranger because they are being perpetrated by strangers. You know, that's another word for angels in the Bible is what? Strangers. The Bible says, be kind to strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Abraham from time to time will encounter a so-called stranger or strangers, and they will turn out to be a representation of the Almighty God. They will be messengers of the Almighty God. I say all of that today because when I was speaking on Saturday, I started to tell us or remind us that it is not our place to speak evil against dignitaries. It is not your place to jump to conclusion about people in the news, about people on television, about what people are doing next door about what people are doing on the streets. No, it is not your place because you are supposed to declare the kingdom come. The Bible says the spirit and the bride say come. We are supposed to announce. The Bible says also that we have been called to show forth the praises of him who has called us out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Our focus needs to be on propagating the light as opposed to describing the darkness. And the reason why this is imperative in the times that we're in or why it has become imperative is because some of us will encounter angels in the physical who have come to help us to get out and not recognize them because they look strange. After, yes, after Saturday's meeting, I had an experience. And the experience that I had was such that the Lord revealed to me that I had a preconceived idea of evil spirits that I was not even aware of. I had a dream, which might have been a vision. I couldn't tell which one it was, whether I was awake or asleep. I couldn't tell. But I, I saw this being who came to a place where I was, and she looked very strange. And the moment I saw how strange she was, I related her being and her look to some evil spirits that I had encountered in the past. And immediately I was like, you're not supposed to be here. Get out of here and take your smell with you. And she was like, are you sure? I said, absolutely. Off you go. And another one said to me, are you sure she will take her stench with her or you have to command this stench to go? I said, absolutely. The stench has to go too. I felt like I was in control of the situation. I was so quick to act him. And then I woke up and I felt, you know, like, okay, that's done. Let's forget about all of that. Let's move on with our day. Until my wife came to me a couple of hours later. And she was like, I, I had a dream. And she was like, I saw this lady in the dream. The moment she said, I saw this lady in the dream, I was taken into the same dream while she was here speaking. And I said, the lady that you see, that you saw, and I described the lady to her. 
And she was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, this is what her hair looks like. I'm not going to describe it because I don't want you to take what I am trying to leave behind, the preconception, and then make it your own, okay? But just understand the principle. Before she told me, all she said was, I saw this lady, and she was there to help. And I described the lady back to her, and she was like, yep, 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 yep. And I said, oh, my goodness. That was an angel. That was an angel. Because from every indication, she even had the emblem of an angel. The Bible says the one who sits in the heavens laughs. And when she was asked to present her identity, all she did was she smiled. Everything lined up. And I'm like, that was the same kind of look that I had seen the same night. It was last night into this morning. But my response was not like her response. She was asking questions. I was feeling like I already knew it all. I'm like, nope, you, not here. Help, this, help. And so when she said that, she was like, no, I'm going to go get ready for service. I couldn't get up for almost 20 minutes because I was so humbled. I felt bad a little bit because I'm like, I could have done better. I was the one up here on Tuesday saying, oh, do not speak evil or Saturday of dignitaries and blah, blah, blah. And here I was, I missed all the clues completely. And I'm like, okay. Ah, we live to fight another day. And so, as I was coming here, that experience was brewing in my spirit. And I'm like, I don't think we're done yet with creating this need for us to be walking in discernment. There are strange beings, there are strangers amongst us who are part of this divine assignment to separate the wheat from the tears. Some of them will do things that you will find annoying. They're not, it's not like they're out to annoy you. You are the one getting annoyed. You understand what I mean? But if you don't know and if you're not conscious of the fact that there are certain things within you that needs to be get rid of, if you think that you have already been made perfect and that everybody else is a sinner and that everybody else is the one doing shameful things, you will be surprised at how angry you will get at certain people, not because they have come to annoy you, but just because you find them annoying. It is up to you to choose peace and holiness. Can I help you with one of the things that the Holy Spirit is teaching me and schooling me on? You know, because these days I've become very careful. Some, some things that I'm still learning, I don't want to come out here and say it because um, it has not been given to me to say, but I'm just excited. But this one, I believe I have the authorization to say it. The Lord said to me, he says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. He said to me, why do you need to follow peace with all men? Uh, I said, because if they're not at peace with me, they will look away from me. He said, that's correct. Because people that you do not like, you try to avoid. Isn't that correct? We we'll close our eyes for evil men to pass. So those people that, that, are, that annoy you on social media, what do you do? You hide their post. Right? So how do you behold the glory of God on people that you do not behold? You understand what I mean? There was once a man in the wilderness crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And several people did not go to see him because they heard that he was dressed in camel's clothing. And so they're like, yeah, yeah, that can't be any important person. And Jesus called it out. Jesus says the reason why they didn't go to see him was because they were expecting him to be robed in fine linen. He says, but are not the ones dressed in fine robes in king's palaces? So they missed the one that was clothed in camel's clothing whose meal was wild locust and honey simply because he did not look the part. Some people would not come here to hear the word of life because we do not look the part. We're not flamboyant enough. We're not clubby enough. You understand what I mean? Yeah, maybe when we have more money, we'll start blowing smoke on the stage too. But for now, we ain't got smoke. You understand what I mean? But, so we don't look the part. And because we don't look the part, they, they're not going to come. And the reality of it is this. We are not supposed to walk by sight. We're supposed to walk by faith. 
And so the Lord said to me, just like people looked away from John, just like many people looked away from Jesus, there were towns that Jesus visited and people did not even go to see him. And Jesus was like, woe unto you, Chorazin, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for you. Because I came and you wouldn't even come out to see what was going on. The Bible says Jesus was not able to do any miracles because of their unbelief. They didn't even bring any sick people. Because they're like, yeah, whatever. We, there's this man roaming around. So their visitation came and they missed it because they had an expectation of it to look a certain way, but it didn't look that way. And so the Bible, says, God was telling me, he says, follow peace with all men so that at least they are peace, are peace enough to take a look at you. Because for men to see God, they have to see you. Jesus said to Philip, because Philip was feeling very excited about the things that they were learning. And he went to Jesus and he says, Jesus, we've seen you. We've seen what you got. You healed the sick, you raised the dead. You're a pretty cool dude. He says, but at this particular point in time, with all due respect, don't mean to hurt your feelings, but can you show us the Father? Philip thought that he had seen all. He was like, I've seen Jesus. He says, now you, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus was like, you're looking at him. He says, this is it. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because the Father is invisible. The Bible says he dwells in unapproachable light. And no one has seen him except the only begotten of the Father. Because Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God is light that dwells in unapproachable light. So until he chooses to reveal himself in a particular form, you cannot see him. And so Jesus was like, we've had many expressions in the past. Moses kind of like saw the backside, some kind of shadow stuff. He said, but you guys are seeing me. I'm walking here. I sit down with you. I wear your kind of clothing. And you are wondering, Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And one of the other things that Jesus said was this. He said, as I am, so are you. So what does that mean? What that means invariably is this. If you do not follow peace with all men and you are not living a holy life, nobody gets to see God. Because the God that many people are going to see is the one that you reveal. That's why it says, be holy as your heavenly father is holy. Holiness, like I've been telling you, means the crux of character. It means the distinctness of God. Or, or the wholeness of character. Wherein your character is like the character of God. God's character is the one that forgives. Do you forgive as easily as God forgives? Do you love without condition? Are you able to be at peace? Are you able to be long-suffering? Do you do all of these things? Because if you do, then people will see God through you. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see God. Because we all should be able to say like Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. But then apparently, we don't even know how to follow peace. Because every little thing people do, we want to call it out. We want to be troublemakers when the Bible says that we are peacemakers. Lastly, before we close out, I want to tie the time of Solomon, I mean the time of Noah, to the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, to the time that we're in, with just this expression. Keep your eyes open and your heart even more open. Keep your eyes open and your heart even more open. Simply because if we do not have an openness of heart, we will miss what God is doing upon the earth. The Almighty God has stipulated that this exercise be wrapped up and that our report cards be presented. 
And God is not looking for how much money you've made and how great of a career that you have built. What God is looking for is how close to his heart yours has become. He's looking for children that will reflect his kindness. He's looking for people that will reflect his character. He's looking for children that will be holy as he is holy. The summary of this exercise and God's expectation of what will come out of this is what my heart becomes in the process. Is my heart going to become like him? The very first scripture that we read today I read it because I want us to recognize that there is something that God is doing upon the earth. He's raising us up from the dead so that he can present us. The Bible says when Jesus raised up the widow of Nain's son, he presented him to the mother. He didn't just raise him up. He says, this is what you lost. This is what should have been. This is that which was taken from you by death. I am presenting him back to you. The Bible says that the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. All of creation is waiting for us to be raised up from the dead and presented and said to be ready for the master's use. We need to be presented as living, as fully equipped. That is the reason why God is going through all of what he's going through and all of what he's putting up with, with each and every one of us so that he can raise us up and present us to the mother, present us to creation. The mother here represents that which you came out of, we came out of creation. He called us out of the ground. He called us out of creation so that we can be carriers of his life and glory. The Lord God Almighty is looking for people that are presentable. The ones that he can say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because you are not just claiming to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but you actually do things to fulfill all righteousness in godly humility. My charge to you today is this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. Seek love. Seek righteousness. Seek peace. Seek joy. You see, because if we seek anything outside of the kingdom, we're going to remain outside of the kingdom. You see, because when God comes, he wants to find you in the kingdom, in that outpost of heaven that is here on the earth. But many of us, well, God forbid, but those, those of us in here, we're going to be found where the bridegroom expects to find us because some people will be found on the streets looking for oil where there is no oil. Some people will be found looking for things that are not missing, but he just wants you to seek love. He wants you to seek righteousness, peace, and joy. I'm going to give you that example again. Today, I could have been seeking victory. I could have been seeking some kind of accolade. I could have been seeking some kind of aggrandizement. But I chose to seek that joy because I knew that that was what was missing. If we would seek joy, even the joy of other people, if we would seek to be at peace with other people. If we would seek to let other people see not how amazing you are, but if you would just let them see that you have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, which is not of your own works, it's a gift, so I don't have to justify myself to you all the time. If we continue to seek those things, guess what? We will not misrepresent ourselves to the angels that are looking and watching for the ones who have the attributes of the sons of God. So in summary, we have two things that we need to do. Number one, do not mistreat or maltreat strangers because there is a strong angelic presence upon the earth at this time. Be swift to hear, slow to speak. Don't abuse anybody. Don't cuss anybody out. Don't judge anybody. If anything at all, if there's a word of encouragement or an 
or, or an exhortation or, 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 or a word of guidance that you can speak to somebody. Speak it in love and let it be so. Just think about this all the time that this person could be an angel that is just here to test if I have patience. I'm just going to conclude that this person has come to test if I will choose love or if I will choose battle. This person has come to test. So there are certain times where we have been tested by the right people, but also there are rogue spirits that are sent loose who are just looking to take advantage of you to get to God. Make sure that you do not allow yourself to be ignorant of the devices of the crafty either. So that is the posture that we need to take. Number one, do not maltreat strangers. That cannot be overemphasized. Number two, don't misrepresent the call of God that is on your life. Don't misrepresent the love with which he has loved you, which is an everlasting love. Begin to live with the consciousness of we are about to be presented to creation. Because creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Eagerly waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And so the father wants to raise us up and not just have us raised up and walking around. He wants to present us to creation. He wants to present us to the ones that we came out of. He wants to present us. Are we presentable? Are we going to represent heaven when heaven presents us? When you walk around with that consciousness, you will watch the things that come out of your mouth. In fact, you will watch the things that you look at. So that when those angels who are standing over your shoulders trace where your eye is going, they will not find pride in your eyes. You know, there is a there is the way you look at people to just let them know you're better than them. The Bible says that a proud look is an abomination to the Lord because it is a haughty spirit. When you look at somebody like, just give them the evil eye. In fact, why would you want to give somebody an evil eye? Oh, my wife says, yes, the bombastic side eye. We're going we're gonna to close in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to prophesy over some people. I want to give you a charge in your spirit. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. I read that just now, and it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Why is that started with but? Verse 32 says, For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So I want to encourage you. Don't let the quest for anything that is out there Replace the drive within you to present yourself unto God, a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable. To present yourself to God at all times. You see, the world that we live in is dog eat dog. People expect you to be ruthless. They expect you to compete for a prize all the time, to win something. And that is the reason why you tell a little lie just to make somebody else look bad. That is the reason why we're told that it's okay to be aggressive and to be this and to be that so that we can win some prizes. It is good to be driven. It is good to, to have, you know, ambition to be better, to be able to showcase the talents and the giftings that we have, our creativity. But we are living in such a time wherein we are being watched. Don't let any one of those spirits that heaven has deployed to assess you find you doing unscrupulous things just because of material gain. None of those things is worth it. Maybe 17 years ago, they might be worth your while, but in the times that we're living, it's not worth your while. Seek to always show the righteousness of the kingdom. Peace and joy. You know, I thank God for the ministry of the seers that are amongst us. You know, because it makes sense to me now the dream that Alan shared with me that came through his wife where she saw me and I was about to preach and then three men came in and their mission was to audit the message that I was preaching. It makes sense now that the Lord will reveal that to you because we're not supposed to just say things and sound like we're Christians and believers and sound great and quote scriptures. But are we able to live up to the things that we say? You know, you can say one thing and it sounds so amazing and so great, but then afterwards you have a dream. How do you perform in that dream? 
You have an encounter. One of your neighbors decides to look at you in a certain way. Do you look at them back in that way? You know, you have this neighbor, every time you wave, they never wave back, and you're like, shame on them. Who has time to be waving you? No, you do. The Bible says, do not be weary in well-doing, because eventually you will reap if you do not faint. I have a neighbor like that. I've waved him, and I'm smiled from a distance, and I know he can see me. I'm a pretty noticeable fellow. And guess what? This afternoon, he had his sunglasses on again, and his lawnmower was on, making a heck of noise with the sunglasses, and I waved at him again. At first, he pretended like he couldn't see me. And then I had a little smile to it. Eventually, he had to stop his machine, and he said hello back to me. And he sounded so soft and so sweet. I'm like, but from a distance, you look like a devil, because every time I wave you, you don't wave back. I didn't say that thing, but I was thinking that to myself. And I felt good, simply because that is the kind of victory that counts. The fact that I did not allow his bad behavior to stop me from being a good person. You understand what I mean? Darkness must not overcome light. It is light. The Bible says do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Because you have been watched. Some of them are not. Because some of them, in fact, incidentally, some of the same people that annoy you are not even people. <laughs> Let me say that again. Not everybody is a body. Or let me put it this way, not everybody is a somebody. There are people that have just been added to the mix just to make the system function. Just to make your test complete. At the end of the day, when, when, when the trumpet sounds and they take their original form, some of us will hit the ground and run. Anyway, it is for our own good. So today, by the grace of God, like I said, I want to prophesy over some people. I have about three prophetic words, all of them from Matthew chapter 5. One of them I've already spoken over you, but the Lord would have me say it as a prophecy over your lives. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 5, we're going to, read verse, we're going to start reading from verse 5. We might read verse 3 again. And I want you to know that these words, as they come forth, because they are the words of your heavenly father, you need to have a posture of obedience, which is obey the instructions contained in them. One of the instructions or one of the ways by which the instruction of the Lord comes to us is to present to us who we are supposed to be so that we can become that person. You know, I can tell Sister Z, oh, Sister Z, can you please get me a cup of coffee? That is an instruction for an action to be carried out. I can say, oh, Sister uh, Z, can you make sure that you show up at the meeting early? I am asking her to be punctual. To be punctual is not necessarily an action. It is more of a status or a status that you need to attain. Be punctual. So there are certain things that God says to us that are not actions that are based on activities but they are things that he's asking us to become, not to do. So become holy as I am holy. Become a peacemaker. Become this and become that. But we were not told that those things are to be obeyed. God is telling you to be holy as he is holy. You need to obey that. We're only focused on the things that we can do because our world runs on activities. But heaven also regards identities. So when I say become somebody, you need to take on that identity. And so Rome, I mean, Matthew chapter 5 verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I want you to receive this prophetic declaration that you will be continually meek before the Lord and that you will inherit the earth. And the reason being that the devil knows that you have to be meek to inherit. Your flesh knows that you have to be meek to inherit. Heaven knows that you have to be meek to inherit. And that is the reason why things will happen to cause you to stop being meek, to want to do something for yourself. And just say, I've been, I've been watching you for a while. You're taking advantage of me. You're walking all over me. I can't take that anymore. And then you break out of your meekness. 
And some of us, is the fact that God has been dealing with you to go through a season without. And you're like, I'm just tired of being broken, broken. I want to go and do something to help myself. You understand what I mean? But the Lord is the one that has both brought you through that place so that you can learn to trust in him. But you are just tired of his instructions. You see, what the Lord showed me was that there are pearls in this place. And you know that a pearl forms within a shell. Two shells. One on top and one at the bottom. So the Lord is forging pearls in this place today. And that is the reason why at the beginning he made me say to you, as I was praying over you today, that you will not despise the chastening of the Lord. That you will not despise the rigors of the Lord's instructions and tuition. I pray that you will not give up on yourself, neither will you give up on the Lord. You know, Justin, sometimes it is hard to study 10 chapters of the Bible a day. It is hard. But if that's the instruction that the Lord has given to you, so that by doing that you can become thoroughly furnished unto every good work, do not despise it. Do not get tired and say, you know what, this thing is too much. Continue to persevere. You need to stay meek because of your inheritance. Verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. To be poor means to have nothing. So I want to encourage you when it comes to spirit, when you come into the realm of the spirit, don't bring any of your own things. Dust are you. You came from the dust. Everything that you try to bring into the realm of the spirit that is not already in the realm of the spirit is alien to the spirit. Don't try to bring any carnal sense and understanding into the realm of the spirit to try to help God. God is your help. You're not his help. So when it comes to the things of the spirit, please be poor. When you show up in the realm of the spirit to acquire spiritual things, don't bring material things with you. Let me explain this because for many years, I didn't have anyone to school me on this scripture. Because I'm like, even the pastors who are saying blessed are the poor in the spirit, they don't particularly appear to be poor. And then the Lord himself had to show me what it means to be poor in spirit. He said to Isaiah, Isaiah, he says, look at all those people. Everything they need is in here. Tell them to come and buy, but only those who have no money. Because if they bring mammon, mammon is not accepted here. Money is not accepted here. Material things are not accepted here. We need them to come believing that we are able to supply. When Simon the sorcerer saw the power of the Holy Spirit in demonstration that was transferable by the laying on of hands, able to transform the lives of men, their households, and ultimately their generation, he says, I want that power. Here is money. How much is it going to cost me? And Peter said to him, your money perish with you. He said, because if you continue to think like that, you do not have a part in this kingdom. Because this kingdom is for people who will come believing that God is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I need to do the things of the spirit as though it is already paid for. The poor in spirit are the ones who have the mentality of heaven supplies it all. I do not bring anything but myself in absolute surrender. When you're rich, you want to make an exchange. You want to give what you have to get what you don't. But when you are poor, you are totally coming at the mercy of the benefactor. The Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I pray for you that in this season, you will have everything that heaven has to offer. The kingdom of heaven is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those people who are rich in the things of this life, in the things of the carnal uh, reality, they cannot fully experience the kingdom of heaven. You know, some people, some of us, we're so, we're so organized, we're so morally behaved, we're so right, we think that is what it takes. No, you have to deprive yourself of your moral high horse and say, you know what, 
I know that I've been a good girl all my life. I don't do evil things. But that is not what I'm using to attain the righteousness of the kingdom. I have to separate myself from anything that is of value, that is outside of the kingdom, and come and say, you know what? Even though I have been good, none is good. I come to receive this righteousness as a gift. The only way to get the righteousness, the peace, and the joy is to know that you cannot earn it, not with any good works, but it is always a gift. May we open our minds in humility to receive all of what God has for us. The last one is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And the last one for now. Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the law. Many of us, are still very conscious of the legal requirements. But Jesus says, I have come to fulfill them all. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will be confident in Jesus' fulfillment of all the requirements so that your mantra will be freely have I received, therefore freely I give. So nothing that I have will be too precious to give for the sake of another. For Jesus says, greater love has no man than this than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. May I continue to be that agent that freely disseminates the gift of God because it has all been fulfilled by Jesus and not by me. He paid the price. He made the final sacrifice. So now that I have received freely, I also grieve, give freely. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I would encourage you as much as you can stand, as many of us as can stand to our feet right now. I want to encourage us to, in fact, let's, let's be seated. Just first of all, let's be seated. Let's be seated. If you can raise your right hand, you're not holding a baby, raise your right hand. And say, Lord, let your beacon be seen over my life. Your angels are all around Fully deployed, let your beacon be seen over my life. Let my light shine. That light that you have given to me, let it shine. That they may see my good works and give glory to you. Let my light shine. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want to encourage you, communion house, as we go continually into this week, practice what we have just done. Use your mouth to speak forth the obedience that is expected of you. When God says, let your light shine, it is yet another instruction that you need to obey. You need to let your light shine. And you may not know how, just say to yourself, my light will shine. Let my light be seen. This light shine. Speak it forth and you'll be amazed at how little transformations will begin becoming apparent in your life, in conversations, in dreams, in reality, and most especially in your understanding of exactly what God is doing with you as a person. Before we have the announcement, and then the offering. I want to encourage you. In fact, I want to indulge you to do something with me. Open Genesis chapter 1 verse 7. Just very quickly, as the offering and the announcement folks are getting ready to come up. In fact, you, you can come up and just come and stand here. This one is going to be a quick work of righteousness. But bring your Bible with you. So because I want you to read this as well. Genesis chapter 1 verse 7. Huh. The Holy Spirit says, if they would. If they would. Would. Jay, will you? Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 7. The Bible says, Thus God made the firmament, and it divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. The Bible says, He that is from above is above all. Jesus says, You are in this world but you are not of this world. Your spirit is above the firmament. 
Why? Because it is in Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. I want you to also add to your confession. I am above and not beneath. You see, because the instruction that the Lord has given is that which is from above needs to be separated from that which is from beneath. We're in a time of great separation. You are from where? You are from above. Your spirit is from above. When you confess that, you know what's going to happen is this. When temptations come, your spirit will overcome because your spirit is above. Your flesh will no longer be able to overpower you and keep you in, in grudges and keep you in, in malice and keep you in pessimism and keep you in unforgiveness. No, because all those things are the works of the flesh and they will no longer be above you in the mighty name of Jesus. The mentality of lack will not be above you. The mentality of not having received will not be above you. But what will be above always is that of his fullness have you received. When you think like that, no one will be able to get you angry. Because a lot of times when we're angry is because we want to prove a point. But when you know that you have already been accepted in the beloved, they can run their mouse. They will not run me out of my place. They can run their mouse, but they will not run me out of my peace in Christ Jesus. Sister Miriam, you are above. You are from above. And it has to show in conversations that you are from above. Because your perspective is the perspective of the one that is above. The Holy Spirit actually said it to me this way. He says, let them memorize Genesis 1-7. Memorize it. That there is a separation. And that which is above from God's perspective is going to be lifted up. And those things that are beneath will stay in their place. It is time for Elevation Communion House. The Lord bless you. Alan. What a night tonight. I don't know, this was off the chain. You know, I'm so thankful for the worship that we had tonight that really help usher in the word to receive. Y'all understand? So we give God praise. Let's celebrate the Lord and what he's done in our midst. God is good. I see my dear brother, Charles. That's okay. We'll go through the offering real quick. To our family online, several ways to give. Our dear brother, Kenyatta, will have the envelope here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have so much to run with tonight. And I'm encouraged because I know many of us have been in the place, Lord, how do we share? How do we witness all of what you have revealed to us, to those around us, even as we were sharing earlier uh, before dinner, those that the Lord has placed on our hearts to minister to, to really share the goodness of God to. And per this message, ain't nothing to it but to do it. God is good. Hallelujah. We'll give everyone just a couple more minutes to prepare the offerings. To our family online, those here, Cash App, Dollar Sign, Communion House, PayPal, at Communion House. We also have Zelle. And you can give on the website, communion.house slash give. Amen. Let us put our hands to the plow and be thankful for this reminder word, what the Lord is doing, the help that he has sent us, and that we can lean into the Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise yet again for this time of meeting where you have met with us in a way that only you can experiencing your presence mightily in our midst. A word to encourage us, O oh God, of deliverance, of empowerment, O oh God, in you, reminding us of our many benefits in you, of our many privileges in you and you alone. Helping us, O oh God, to be that one that is meek, helping us to be that one that is poor in spirit. Father, we give you praise for the elders that you have set before us, the leaders of this household, O oh God, making the vision plain before us that we may run with it. 
Lord, as we give tonight, move on our hearts, for indeed we declare that we shall be cheerful givers. O oh God, giving, sacrificially giving, in obedience, in honor to what it is that you're doing here in this house. Father, as we give, we thank you for the open door that you have set before us that no man can shut. We thank you for this night of impartation, O oh God, as we're stretching forth to give of a spirit of discernment, O oh God, of the curds and the honey, knowing to refuse the evil and choose the good. Lord, there is none like you. How merciful you are unto us. Lord, let these offerings unto you be found pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you. For we know that you have given seed to the sower. All glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate his name. God is good. I want to um, remind us tomorrow, you know what we're doing. We're praying. Let's press into that. I'm so thankful for those of us that have just been drawing, you know, from that prayer and what has been coming forth and really the grace that the Lord has uh, granted unto us this season to read and to pray. You see, so we're thankful for that. And let's just celebrate the man and woman of God here. Let's honor them for what the Lord is doing in their lives, how the Lord raises them up and how we're catching this mantle by the Holy Ghost. Amen. God is good. Everyone have a blessed night.